Welcome to the Exam Study Expert Podcast, helping you ace your exams at school and university through the psychology of high performance and the science of studying smarter, not harder. It's my pleasure to introduce your host, the Cambridge-trained memory psychologist and exam success coach, William Wadsworth. Hello and welcome to the Exam Study Expert podcast and to the first episode in a very special season of episodes on the science of learning. One of my big goals for the podcast this year was to bring you more scientists whose work translates beautifully into practical hacks and strategies you can use to be more successful and less stressed in your studies. We've already heard from a couple of fantastic and highly respected researchers, including renowned mindset scholar Professor Tim Wilson, explaining the surprising impact of the stories we tell ourselves and what to do about it, and expert on student motivation Dr Erica Patel in episode 43, breaking down what works and what doesn't when it comes to getting motivated. We're launching into a series of episodes on perhaps my favourite topic of all, your mysterious and wonderful memory, and what you can do to tame it. In other words, to learn fast and forget things slowly. Memory is so much, folks, probably more than you realise. Your autobiographical or episodic memory, as psychologists call it, is the thing that holds all you've ever known and experienced as a person. Places, people, tastes, smells, sights. Your procedural memory holds the codes that allow you to perform physical tasks, uh, largely intuitively, like how to balance when riding a bike or how to use a knife and fork. Of particular interest to us here today, our semantic memory is what holds all of our fact knowledge, from the capital of France through to your trigonometry equations. When it comes to education and learning for exams, having a really secure memory of the core knowledge you need for your course isn't just about your ability to regurgitate the basics, because without that knowledge as a secure foundation, you can't do anything fun with it, like apply that knowledge in an unfamiliar situation, or synthesise across topics and draw complex ideas together. Most students I know spend vast amounts of time trying to learn the knowledge they need to know for their courses. So, Over the next few weeks, I want to dive deep into the real secrets of how to learn your stuff fast, make sure it's securely memorised so you don't forget it as soon as you learn it. It's all about saving you time by showing you way faster routes to learn your stuff. We're going to kick things off today with a bit of an overview of some of the most important strategies we'll be talking about in more detail over the coming weeks. I'm rebroadcasting a segment for you from a conversation I had with Dr. Jana Weinstein-Jones back in the very early days of the podcast, way back in episode 7. It's mandatory listening in my book, and even if you've listened to it already, I'd say it's well worth a re-listen to remind yourself of the main points. So just before I bring Jana back onto the show, uh, let me give her a quick intro for you. So she's a cognitive psychologist and one of the two founders of the Learning Scientists Project, uh, a group of scientists who've had an incredible impact on getting good learning science out into the world via their blog, podcast and book, which is called Understanding How We Learn and is one of my highly recommended uh, books, particularly if you want a rigorous but readable primer on the science of learning. Put the link to that in the show notes if you'd like. In the interview extract you're about to hear, she gave me a whistle stop tour of the six biggest strategies that students should really know about when it comes to learning fast and remembering your stuff. I started by asking Jana to walk us through the six strategies that are most helpful for students to know. She knows her stuff, as you're about to hear, and is really great at explaining it and making it really clear. So hold on tight. We're going to go pretty fast today. Here's Jana Weinstein-Jones. So the six strategies aren't, you know, it's not just the fun, like there are six strategies, which yeah. does sound kind of fun, um, especially when they're drawn out on a little hexagon like we've done in the past. But these strategies actually come from decades and decades of research into cognitive psychology um, and that figured out some of the best ways to study. And really, they're not six equally important, equally good study strategies. There are two that form sort of the main backbone. And I believe that you have already talked about them on a previous podcast, but those are space practice and retrieval practice. 
and I'll talk more about those, I think, in this episode. But essentially, the idea is spacing out your studying so that you're studying little bits of time at a time across a longer period. And then during that studying, you're hopefully doing what's called retrieval practice, which is bringing information to mind from memory, rather than just, for example, reviewing or rereading your notes or rewriting them, which is sometimes feels like a good idea, but it doesn't actually help if all you're doing is just write, rewriting the same thing with pretty pens. <laughs> so sure. that, those are the two main study strategies. And the way that I think about the study strategies is actually in terms of a, um, a sort of a bit of a process model. So we start off by planning out when we're going to study. And that's where space practice comes into it. So you're figuring out when it is that you're going to practice. I know one of the things we might talk about is revision schedules. So the idea of drawing up, you know, I'm going to study this subject, then the subject, then, and, you know, there's much to be discussed about that, but that could involve, you know, planning for space practice. Another planning technique is something called interleaving. So that's another one of the six strategies. And the idea with interleaving, is that when you are within a study session, it's sort of like spacing on a micro level, but spacing within a study session, where instead of deciding, okay, I'm going to focus for this next hour on this one type of math problem and solve as many as I can and get really good at them, you think about interleaving the different concepts that you're studying or revising. And so you might try different math problems, for example, even though that will be harder it's actually going to help you learn how to do those different type of problems better in the long run than massing and doing over and over again a similar type of problem. So that's another strategy into leaving. So those are the two planning strategies. And then, and we'll come back to retrieval practice at the end, since we've mentioned that already, but then I think about developing understanding. And developing understanding can all be done in conjunction with space practice, also using retrieval practice, but there are a few additional strategies that can be helpful there, uh, actually three of them. So the other three strategies that we haven't mentioned yet fit into development of understanding. So one of them is elaboration. And the idea of elaboration is simply adding additional information to your memory. So really, it's just about building up memories to make them more complex. And that's how we pass from rote memorization to real understanding. It's still a memory process, but it's the idea of building more complex memories so that you're not just able to answer a simple factual question, you're able to explain why and how that answer came about. So think of it as, you know, the difference between memorizing your times tables, which is, you know, important and useful, versus understanding Understanding how it is that multiplication works and therefore being able to multiply any two numbers, not just the ones that you've memorized. So elaboration can take many different forms, but one of them that's really good is asking yourself how and why questions about how things work. So using that same example about times tables. So why is it that, you know, what what time six times eight equals 48. Someone who doesn't understand it will just say, well, that's what I memorized. But someone who does can say, well, look, you add up, you know, eight, six times or six, eight times, you know, whichever. Uh, so it's developing that kind of flexible understanding. And there's lots of different things that fall under elaboration and cause elaboration, like, for example, linking a concept to your own real life. So there are many different ways of doing it, but elaboration is one way to develop understanding. Another one is the use of concrete examples. So teachers will often use examples in their teaching, but as a student, you could also be looking for examples of abstract concepts that you learn um, you know, in your everyday life. And I can give some more examples of that in a bit once we get into things. And then I just wanted to mention the last strategy under developing understanding, which is dual coding. This is the idea of combining both words and visuals to help you learn. It's not just for so-called visual learners, which I don't know if you've covered this, but there's not much evidence to suggest that that's really a thing. The evidence points more to the fact that visuals and images, diagrams and so on are helpful to anyone learning a difficult subject. In some cases, you may not need them because something is simple enough or concrete enough. But as soon as things get abstract, a uh, diagram or a visual, a picture or a sketch is a really great way of making things more concrete. And then 
after you know the developing understanding part, there is the reinforcement of learning, and that's where retrieval practice comes in and becomes really, really important because it's through retrieving the information from memory that you actually strengthen the memory itself. Sounds good, and that's very clear structure. So planning your studies first and then developing your understanding and then re- reinforcing it. Yeah, although I should say it's not necessarily linear like that so you that retrieval practice can really happen sooner rather than later and doesn't need to wait until you've completely developed understanding so in that sense it's not like a step one step two step three but it's just three aspects of studying yeah yeah makes sense makes sense you you mentioned we might sort of come back and talk a little bit about the planning when when we work and you mentioned there there are a couple of useful strategies you can think about when you're planning your studies What's your kind of practical advice for students, uh, particularly when in the run up to, to big exams? So how do they plan their study time? How do they plan what to do and when? Well, you know, it takes me back to my university days where I do remember that I created a very strict study plan for myself. And I, but I think in retrospect, what that really was, was a big session of cramming because I hadn't really done any studying throughout the year. So I to go back, you know, to my former self, I would try to encourage myself to actually you know do something with the course material throughout the year rather than just having this big you know cramming period but I know that you know we can't jump back in time so a lot of students are going to be faced with you know decide is trying to figure out how to learn all the material in a short space of time but even with that there's still some things that can be done I would recommend if you're going to make a schedule for yourself that you know this is going to Uh, point towards some of the self-care that we might talk about later is that you make sure it's not unrealistic and that it includes plenty of breaks um, and, and, you know, plenty of opportunities to rest, to recuperate, and also um, to sort of consolidate some of the memories because all the studying, all the learning isn't necessarily going to happen um, just during when you're sitting down focusing on it some of it is going to percolate like you're having a bath and you might have a thought and you're like oh yeah that's how those two things connect and that's really the best type of learning opportunity the more casual learning opportunity where you integrate understanding of things um, with your real life now i'm not saying you're going to be differentiating you know in the bath that that sounds pretty <laughs> <laughs> i don't know i can't imagine myself doing that yeah sure you. um but some, for something a little bit more relatable or you know you might spot something some area in your bus that you would want to differentiate <laughs> uh, but you know that there, there are many different ways in which we can think about things and it doesn't have to be you know rigidly uh, ensconced in that timetable so just just know that you know your self-care your sleep your whatever it is that you need to do is actually going to be contributing positively to your learning as well and isn't just like other stuff that I'm fitting the learning around right so we're not you know completely context dependent in terms of learning quite context dependent so a lot of the time the things that you sit down to study are not going to sort of pop up randomly but the more we can encourage ourselves to think about these things in more casual situations the more they're going to become part of our you know complex web of memories that we have about our lives and thus much easier to conjure up when we need to versus just, you know, squared away in some box of like, this is just some academic stuff that I'm supposed to learn for an exam. So I guess I, what I would recommend is sure, make yourself a schedule so that you, you, you know that you're you're going to have enough time to cover all the units, for example. So in my case, I remember studying for economics, but every time I picked up the book, I would just go to the very beginning. So I got really good at chapter one, <laughs> but I never <laughs> really, you know, got further. <laughs> um, so, you know, by all means, plan out to make sure you cover everything. But once again, you don't necessarily want to just go linearly. That's where the interleaving will come in. So, don't do what I sort of try to do, which is start with chapter one and then go on, because what you might end up doing is getting stuck on that chapter one. And in any case, like that's not really how your memory works in terms of like chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, your understanding sure. grows as you go through everything. So there's no harm in, you know, jumping into a later section first and then going back and sort of be a bit more flexible with it when you're doing your planning but just use the planning to be realistic about how much you're going to be able to cover and that you know how much time you can spend on one particular concept um 
one thing I didn't know when I was a student for sure is that instead of organizing things by chapter, for example, which seems so obvious or by topic, pick out the most important concepts from the whole entire semester or year or whatever it is, and then focus your studying on those, because that's really how you know, you're going to be able to gain the knowledge that you need in order to pass the exam. It's not by going through everything systematically. It's actually by focusing more of your time on the core concepts or the important concepts that come up a lot. And then maybe less time on some of the things that are peripheral. Probably just worth saying, if you're a younger student, so you're still in middle school, high school, um, or perhaps you're taking GCSEs, A-levels here in the UK, this advice might not be quite so relevant. If you've got a smaller course overall, perhaps you do want to look at all of it. Uh, but fully agree with Jana, once you get into more advanced courses at uh, university, college, and you have a lot to learn, then prioritisation does become really important. And, you know, at the end of the day, maybe that's OK, as long as you've understood the core, more, more important ones that, that are the foundation of, of the whole material that you're studying. Uh, so I would say, you know, make time, to make the study schedule, but with the caveat that there needs to be ample time for breaks and ample time for relaxation. And that's also part of the learning process rather than just like other stuff. It's equally important. And then also when you are planning what you're going to study in each of the sections, don't just go through and do it chronologically or by topic. If you have a list of topics, actually sit down and think about priorities and what would be most important to learn if you only get to, you know, the first five on your list of 10. Makes sense. Makes sense. You mentioned in an ideal world, if you could go back to the start of the year, you might build in uh, some time to uh, you'd be reviewing what you're learning as you're going through your course rather than leaving it all to the final few mm-hmm. weeks. Any thoughts on practically how, how we could do that? Yeah, so I would say that, you know, it is very tough because often we're very driven by external pressure, like an external exam. And when that's not about to occur, it's very difficult to motivate ourselves to do additional studying because we've got the homework and this and that, the other. But what I would say then is instead of trying to formally sit down and, you know, do extra studying, because I honestly feel like that's such a reach, I would say just try to really link what you're studying with your everyday life and find, find the, you know, the real life application of what it is that you're learning even if it's like you know what would be amazing is keep a journal and then you know write in it try to write in it frequently it doesn't have to be long entries but it can just be like today i learned about this and you know i'm i'm having a tough time figuring out how that would be relevant in real life oh but there was this one time and sort of almost like just reflect on what you learn so it doesn't have to be studying session it doesn't have to be like sitting down opening your books and so on and so forth but maybe you had some thoughts maybe you know the material seemed particularly difficult but you're not sure why or maybe it seemed particularly intuitive but any thinking you can do about what you learned so that it's not just confined to that you know hour-long lesson that's going to be some really good genuine space retrieval practice that's great. I like. I love the idea of. I, I guess you know, keeping your keeping your learning journal or your 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 learning diary. I think that's. I think it's a really yeah. nice idea. Cool. I want to just t- touch a little bit more on some of the concepts you talked around uh, to, for for developing your understanding. So, um, elaboration, concrete examples, dual dual coding, and um, perhaps starting with dual coding because because we, we haven't talked about learning styles you mentioned uh, the idea of learning styles and uh, if you, you might have heard people talk about whether you're a visual learner or a kinesthetic learner or an, an auditory learner um you, in, as, it was, as you were saying the, the evidence for for those as different styles isn't isn't that compelling but you're still saying dual coding using words and pictures together can be can be quite useful for people so with respect to dual coding what might be interesting for students to do Um, is if you're looking at, for example, a textbook, there's often an image. And sometimes these images are purely decorative and they're kind of like there just to be like, this isn't just words on a page. Look, there's a picture. And those are kind of useless. But oftentimes it will be a picture that really illustrates something. It might be a diagram. It might just be an example of something in the text. And so what you could try to do is take a look at the picture and actually describe what's going on in the picture and why it's used in the text to illustrate that particular point and you know this I think is important to do because personally I remember I would get really 
kind of overwhelmed by textbooks. It could just be my ADHD, but I never knew like when you were supposed to look at a picture. I know that sounds really weird, but there'd be all these pictures on the page and then there'd be text. And then sometimes there's like a box with more text. And I, I was always sort of like, okay, are these like asides or, you know, should I look at them first, then read it? Or should I just read it and then look at the pictures? And I just was like, oh, I don't know. I just want to read a novel where there's only words. Uh, so I would say use, rather than being distracted by those pictures, actually use them and be like, okay, so here, here's a picture of X. It's here because it's trying to illustrate this point. And here are the features of the picture that illustrate it. Then you can do the opposite thing and you can look at the words and then be like, okay, there isn't a picture for this, but if I was to draw one, I might draw, you know, this thing, or I might, you know, if you don't want to draw, you can even like Google a picture and be like, ah, yeah, this perfectly demonstrates that concept or whatever it is. So finding pictures, finding or drawing pictures that demonstrate concepts is a great way to do it but also using pictures you're provided with and actually sort of elaborating on them on them verbally will be good and then you can also integrate dual coding with practicing retrieval so you could try to remember some information in the form of a picture or a diagram or a mind map or whatever you want so you know don't look at your notes but actually draw out what you can remember from memory or pick a picture without any words, without many words on it, and then try to write a paragraph describing it. So you can kind of play around with it, depending on you know how well you know the topic. If you really don't know it, then just do the version where you have the picture in front of you and the words, and you can kind of link them between each other. But as you get to know the material better, try to practice without you know without the information in front of you, and just use the pictures as cues for retrieval. Got it. You ended by sort of saying using the pictures as cues. I, I get one of the things I've I've sort of found it helpful about dual coding is it it gives you two ways to remember something when you are faced with an exam and you're trying to remember what you did. You can remember the words and you can also remember the pictures. And exactly. It gives you two ways to to prompt your memory. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's something I missed saying. So thank you for filling that in. That's very important. And so, and in in sort of similar vein, perhaps you could give an, a a concrete example of both a concrete example and elaboration in in action and how I might use those uh, similarly if I was a, if I was a student. Yeah, absolutely. I, so let's see. Let's start with elaboration, although now I think I'm going to get myself in trouble because I was about to talk about integration and I've completely forgotten how it works. <laughs> what integration involves. So maybe that's a bad example. But whatever math problem you're doing, so let's say you're doing a math problem and it's got many steps. One form of elaborate, elaboration would be simply to um, you know, speak out loud the steps that you would take to solve those problems. And apparently some students just do this spontaneously. I was not someone, I generally had this weird thing about not really um, talking out loud when I'm the only person in a room because I felt weird about yeah, it. Sure, me too. <laughs> <I don't, laughs> but apparently lots of people do that, but others don't. So if you're someone who doesn't really do that, uh, first of all, know that it comes with age because more and more I've started to do it and I'm like, oh, I've become one of those people. <laughs> but also know that it can help your learning. So as you're walking through the steps, if you actually just say out loud to yourself, okay, so now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take you know, the integral, I'm making it up, <laughs> and do whatever it is with it. So you're talking through each step. That you know how often the teachers say you have to show your work, right, by writing it out. Well, you can also show your work to yourself by speaking it out loud. And then that's going to help you catch errors, but it's also going to reinforce your understanding of it as you go through and, you know, do each step at a time. It can also help you focus on it. So there are many different benefits to it, but I would say, you know, one of the ways to do elaborative integra interrogation or elaboration is simply just to step yourself through things explicitly and out loud. A brief aside, that reminds me of, um, I was reading about Japanese uh, Japanese train operators the other day, and they do something called pointing and calling. Um, so even the most mundane aspects of train operation, so the, the speed the train's pulling out of the station at or what position a particular key switch is in, the assistant train operator will point and call the train is at 10 miles per hour as we're pulling out or the whatever switch is on. And that just kind of eliminates the chance that they've got any of that wrong. Yeah, yeah no, that sounds really like a good application of elaborate, or in this case of um, the thinking out loud technique. Um, another way of doing elaboration though is just to ask yourself how and why questions about how how things work and why. I don't know if that would work for the train 
<laughs> no, 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 <laughs> probably not. Um, so, but in a situation that's, you know, that's less about you doing something with steps such as, you know, solving a math problem or driving train, elaborate interrogation would be, let's say you learn a physics concept like something about gravity mm. or you know it could be something about driving a train except you'd be doing it sort of um you know after the fact or you'd be doing it as you're learning about train driving or being a pilot would be a good one ask yourself how and why questions so why is it that you know when i press this button this happens or whatever or if you're learning it more abstractly in physics why is it that planes don't fall you know what is it about it so that you're no longer just saying like okay here's the formula for gravity or here's the formula for force and whatever i actually don't know why planes don't fall down <laughs> this is great i give all of these examples about things i don't know about but um you know instead of learning them in a kind of factual way think about why it is actually that way you know so why is it how is it that right now my voice is carrying through you know, from my laptop all the way to England and being recorded. Well, I don't know. So I might speculate and then I might, I might have to Google it a little bit, but that will be a better way probably for me to learn about, you know, sound waves. And if I just read a factual piece about it, right. So now I'm applying it to real life example and I'm asking how and why this works. And then I'm trying to answer that using both my own knowledge and you know, some supporting information. So that would be an application of elaborative interrogation. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. It, it, the thing about these strategies that's kind of a good thing, but also a tricky thing is that they're not each self-contained. Like each of the strategies, by definition, everything's going to be space practice because you're doing it again. Like if I'm thinking about a concept when I'm not in class or studying, that's space practice right there. Retrieval practice is always going to be the case, too, because you're always going to be using memory to some extent. And then, you know, with elaborative interrogation, you're likely to use a concrete example um, and you might be looking at a picture. So, you know, you're kind of really doing a lot of the strategies at once versus this strategy or that strategy. It's just learning kind of a way to think about uh, studying as more than just trying to learn material. Yeah, that's a really good point. So a concrete example of concrete examples. Yeah, perfect. Let's do that. Yeah. So the one that we use a lot and now it's sort of fixed in my mind is um, the example of scarcity as an abstract concept. So scarcity is this idea that, you know, as demand for something increases, supply decreases, and then that thing becomes more valuable and price might go up. So that's very abstract what I just described. But now I can tell you a concrete example you know, still sticking with the idea of planes not falling out of the sky. Um, if you are trying to buy plane tickets, which I often am because I travel a lot, you will find that as the time comes closer, there are fewer and fewer tickets available. And as such, then the prices go up and up. The same kind of thing happens with ticket scalpers who buy up tickets to a football match and then they're selling them for more because, you know, demand is outstripping supply. Uh, but the thing about those two concrete examples, the planes and the ticket scalpers, is that they're both focused on tickets. And if you were completely new to the concept of scarcity, you might misunderstand and think that it always involves ticket sales. Now, that might seem silly for people who know what scarcity is as a general concept. But this is what typically happens when anyone acquires a new concept. It's just that they think that it has to be about that specific concrete example. So the idea here is that you need to be looking at and using as many different concrete examples as possible. So in this concept of scarcity, we could also think about a desert and how there's you know, no water. And then if we find some water, we're all going to run to it and, and try to drink from it, which is a completely different thing, uh, obviously, than anything to do with tickets. But it's still the same, the same abstract concept concept. So what we've done here is we've, we've broadened our understanding of the abstract concept by coming up with an example that's still about the same abstract concept, but uh, now about a completely different, uh, I guess, at least um, artificially or surface details are completely different in this concrete example. So it's the idea of using multiple different concrete examples about the same abstract concept. Often teachers will only give one. And so it's a good idea to find more 
in you know in your real life ideally or even if you just sort of like try you know to focus on finding examples for a particular concept well thanks again to yana for that fantastic overview We actually went on to have quite a long conversation after this about self-care, how to look after mind and body as a student. And if you want to listen to that, you can find it in the second half of episode seven. But just before I leave you today, let me recap what we've talked about today, because we've covered a lot. We had retrieval practice and spaced learning forming the backbone of all this. Retrieval practice being about bringing back to mind information from memory and spacing out that retrieval practice. So doing it repeatedly, repeatedly trying to test yourself on what you know, bring it back to memory today, tomorrow, a few days time next week. We also talked about interleaving as another really useful strategy for planning what you're working on and when, perhaps switching back and forth between practicing two types of maths problem, for example, in the same study session, rather than just working on one type of problem. We covered three strategies for developing understanding. So we talked about elaborative interrogation, asking yourself those kinds of questions, concrete examples, having clear, tangible examples of a particular concept or principle. And we also talked about dual coding, taking advantage of using visuals and words together. Now, as I said back in the intro, this episode is actually setting up and introducing a whole new season of episodes going deeper into many of the specific strategies we've had an overview to just now. So, To get your appetite whetted, let me just share a few highlights of what's coming up in the weeks to come. In a couple of weeks' time, uh, we'll be joined by Dr. Caroline Kuepertetzel, also of the Learning Science Project, uh, Learning Scientists Project, I should say, who will be talking us through spaced learning, why it matters so much, and exactly how to get the most out of it in practice. You can also look forward to hearing from Oliver Cavaglioni, ex-headmaster, master draftsman, and a real authority on how to use visual strategies like dual coding to learn more effectively. Towards the end of the season, I'm going to be joined by Dr. Veronica Yan for a brilliant conversation about the secrets of interleaving, which is a very powerful strategy, but in my experience, one of the most underused of all the strategies that, that, that we talked about with Yana today. But uh, next week, you can look forward to a deep dive on what I think is probably the most important learning strategy of all, retrieval practice. It's a really simple idea in principle, but applying it consistently and well in reality is not always easy. I'm going to be sharing some of my top tips from all the work I do with students for making retrieval practice actually work in practice for you. And I'm going to be interspersing uh, my top tips with some choice comments from past and future guests about why retrieval practice is so important. In the meantime, if you need some guidance on using all of these strategies for yourself, you can head to examstudyexpert.com forward slash coaching to learn more about my one-on-one exam success coaching programmes. That's examstudyexpert.com forward slash coaching. For now, thanks again for listening today, and I will look forward to seeing you next time. If you've got exams coming up, you can now get all of William's favourite tips and tricks to save you time and get you higher grades, all in one handy cheat sheet. Grab your copy at examstudyexpert.com slash free tips. Thanks again for listening, and see you soon.